Greetings, hello, welcome to my world, welcome to our world, our story circle that's happening all over the world with storytellers from every nation. And it's ever growing, ever increasing, whatever platform that you're at, you're watching me on at the moment, um, make sure you visit www.worldstorytellingcafe.com where you can check out the rest of this ever increasing circle of stories and also greet and meet all of the tellers and, uh, and watch your favourites over and over again during these times of woe and times of trouble. Uh, great to virtually see you. Welcome to the cafe, pull up a chair and let's have some stories and let's have some fun. Thank you ever so much. I hope you enjoy the set. Let me take you to a place in the middle of nowhere, a dry, arid place, a hot place, where the sun, sun beats down all day mercilessly. And at night, the temperature drops significantly so that two blankets will never be enough to sleep comfortably if you're out in the open. And in this place, in this place there was a city a city of, of high walls with a, a great gate that would open twice a day, once at dawn, once at dusk, allowing you in or allowing you out. And in this city of cobbled streets and passageways, a labyrinthian city where you could easily get lost if you didn't know where you were or if it had been your first visit, you would need a guide and there will be plenty of guides offering their services to you should you be travelling alone. But whichever guide you hired, be he good or be she, bad, eventually they would lead you right to the centre of the city. And in the centre of the city there was a great, a great square, a piazza, a plaza. And in this place, that's where the restaurants were. And this was the main reason why so many travellers from far and wide would, would flock to this place in the middle of nowhere and some people would, would travel for months and months to get there. Why? Well, because the food in these restaurants was superb. It was the best. And each one, each one had a speciality that you would seek out and before you arrived, even on your long journey to the city, your, your taste buds, you would be salivating and, and dreaming, dreaming of the food that you were going to order. But there was one restaurant, a cafe if you wish, in this walled city, that sold just one thing. And just one thing could be ordered. You, you wouldn't need to look at a menu, in fact, there weren't any menus. For there was one thing that you could eat at this place. The one thing that you would remember forever. That when you tasted it, you would begin to float and, and, and daydream. And all of your memories of everything you've ever done would flood into your head. And when you finally got to sleep that night after tasting this thing, your dreams would expand and you would remember every dream you've ever dreamt. The good ones, not the bad. And every colour, every colour you, you loved would, would, would appear before you. Every, every scent, every sound, every, every person you loved would flood into your dreams and you would have a wonderful, wonderful time. This very thing that you would have tasted at this cafe in the walled city, that you had travelled months and months and months to get to, was soup. Yes? Soup. <laughs> soup. Do you like soup? I suppose there's nothing to dislike about soup. I mean, I presume we've all got our favourite soups. Uh, there's soups for many occasions. Soups for uh, when it's winter and you want to be warm. Soups to refresh you when it's summer. Soups of every, every colour, description, texture. But this soup, in the soup cafe, was the soup. The soup. The soup. The soup. The finest 
soup in the world. This soup, some say, had been cooking and simmering for 500 years, more or less. Yes, for the soup was in a cauldron, a great pot, maybe of earthenware, maybe of cast iron, I know not. But this soup had first started many hundreds of years ago, and the soup that was being served to this very day had a small trace of that first soup that had ever been cooked. How? Because this soup pot never ran dry. It was someone's job to keep topping up the ingredients in the pot when it ran low. And it was someone's job to keep the fires burning beneath the cauldron 24-7. The fire never went out, the soup never stopped bubbling, and the layers of flavour just kept increasing with every passing day. And so that there was a small atom of the very first flavour of the very first soup that had ever been cooked in the pot, running through the present soup. And as each day went on, the smell of the soup and the taste of the soup got better and better and better. Ah, oh, the soup. What wonder. What joy. What ecstasy. It was difficult to get a table this restaurant at this cafe. Why? Because <laughs> it was the soup, the soup, <laughs> the finest soup in the world. I mean, there was a waiting list, my friends. <laughs> oh yes, a waiting list. How long? Well, wouldn't be unreasonable to say that I think it was about a two year waiting list. Yeah, two years. Two years! You put your name down and, and you waited and you, you marked up your calendar <laughs> and you waited for that day. Dreaming, dreaming of the time, the day that you would, you'd go and taste the soup and you'd make the journey with the ones you'd chosen to make the journey with, that special journey to the city, to the soup restaurant. When finally the day arrived and you sat yourself down at a table, a, a waiter was there to help too. If you were lucky, you got one of the tables outside and, and the sun had begun, begun to drop below the horizon and and the stars were rising and twinkling, and, and the smell of jasmine emerged from hidden spaces. And your soup would arrive in a bowl and be placed in front of you. <laughs> you, you just sat there for a while and, and, and contemplated. You thought of the, the journey, you thought of the time it had taken you to get there, and, and you took a, a smell. hardly pick up the spoon and maybe you don't pick up the spoon maybe you uh, maybe you pick up the bowl and uh, you, bring, you bring it to your lips and you begin to taste the soup with <clears throat> the soup the wonder that is and you take your time and you enjoy your soup and it's the best meal you've ever ever had and ever will have the soup of course there were other restaurants in the square and not quite as good as the soup restaurant but still good and, and when the restaurant the kitchens were in full swing and the smell of food wafted up into the air through the jasmine and up into the starry sky and, and the wind would gently blow the smell of the, the food and the restaurants all over the city. And this would alert, alert those folks who lived in that city who had very little, in fact some of them had nothing at all. These were the people who only had this. Hold out your hand for me and let's uh, Let's have a think about this. Imagine if this was all you had, holding out a hand, a hand that asked for something. 
something to eat or a little something to spend, for there was nothing else for that person. So yes, the beggars were there in the city, and, and the beggars were very good at what they did, and, and the beggars had got used to the word no, for the word no was the word they heard the most. Sometimes they heard a yes, but mainly a no's, and, and there are many ways of saying no, aren't there? I mean, have a think yourself, can you say no? Uh, yes, we can say no. <laughs> no no is, is sometimes hard to say, um, sometimes yes is hard to say, but no is sometimes more difficult. No, I won't. It's a dip. Ooh. Ah, I've used my hands. That helped me to say no. And, and there are other ways of saying no with your hands too, aren't there? Can you think of any? Ooh, not even a word that time. Just a... Ooh, this was a hard one for the beggars, where people just say no <laughs> on your way. The worst type, I believe, for the beggars was the one where don't look at you. And they just, they know you're there, they sense you're there, but you know, they just don't acknowledge you, they don't, uh, they don't want to acknowledge you, you're, you're nothing to them. They just turn away. And... But this didn't deter our beggars in the city, for there were rich pickings, well, relatively rich pickings, for rich they were not. I mean, uh, <laughs> some coins or a piece of bread, a piece of fruit. This would constitute richness for these people. And the beggars would, as the diners appeared too at night, they would, they would congregate in the shadows around the square, the plaza, the piazza, and they would wait. And, and sure enough, the tables would be set up outside and, and <laughs> the diners would sit and, and and that's where the beggars would go to work too, and they would beg at the tables and, and try their luck. And one night, a beggar, on his way to the square, to where the diners were waiting for their, their food to arrive, and, and the lucky few whose uh, turn it was to be at the soup cafe, the soup restaurant, would be taking their tables and, and, and maybe even sitting in contemplation with that first bowl of soup that arrived in front of them, beginning to float, and the smells. The beggar could smell the smells of, ah, oh, it's the time, you know, just to smell the wonderful aroma of food. On his way to the square, the beggar found a piece of bread. Oh, ah, this is wonderful. Today I can eat. Ha! <laughs> the beggar went to that shady place, that place of shadows, of obscurity, of that hiding place that he knew, where he could he could settle down unseen and undisturbed and and, uh, and have a meal of the bread. <laughs> he was beginning to think about tucking into the bread, he would chew slowly and, and small bites and make it last uh, a long, long time and, and remember food that he had eaten in the far past and his in the distant memories of when he was younger and when he had more. But he stopped and he could, he could smell the smells coming from the piazza and, and he thought, why not? What could be the harm? Yes, he said, I will go to the restaurants and I will beg at the tables and, and I will ask if I could dip my piece of bread in, in, into their plate and then I'll have a finer meal. I mean, imagine, I've got nothing to lose. I've got the bread, it's mine. I didn't steal it. I found it. It's mine. But oh, if I could dip it into something. Imagine the meal. Oh, it'd be twice as good, three times as good, four times as good. So he was resolved to go, and he did. He went, and he went to the piazza, and the smells of the food were intoxicating. And then he saw the soup restaurant and the diners already with bowls of soup, and he thought, now, nah, like, <laughs> yeah, I'll try other places first, you know. <laughs> 
Maybe I'll try there last, if I've had no joy. For he knew that the nose at the soup cafe would be, well. He began begging at the tables of the other restaurants in the square. And of course, the full, uh, the full range, the full spectrum of nose. <laughs> and so, I mean, let's face it, would, uh, would you let someone dip their piece of bread into your meal? Would you? Oh, you would. Well, that's, that's kind of you. That's nice. That's lovely, actually. But um, I'm afraid the beggar encountered no one like you who said, help yourself. No, 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 no. It was an evening of no's. And the no's led, led the beggar to the soup cafe. This was the last place. And he began begging at the tables outside. And of course, what did he hear? No. So he decided to step inside the restaurant. Inside, the tables weren't quite as good. I mean, it was hotter in there. You know, there was a fire, but the cauldron was in there with his, the soup. These. <laughs> yeah. But the, if, you, if you had one of the tables inside, it was a little bit uh, stuffier, you know. You're still grateful to be there, you know. You, you, had your, you, you had your bowl of soup, and it was the most incredible thing ever. But, but you know, the best tables were outside. It was, maybe it was a luck of the draw. Maybe people paid extra. I don't know how it worked. But in he went. He stepped over the threshold into the restaurant proper, and there was the cauldron bubbling on the fire that never went out. And there were tables here and tables there and diners with their bowls of soup. And he just I began to bet. When there he saw in the background, just subtly arms folded, didn't have to make a fuss. The restaurant manager, the owner, the grandee of the soup cafe, didn't have to open his mouth either. He just um, did this to the beggar, Not wanting to make a fuss in front of his diners. On you go, yeah. And the beggar knew it was time to leave. And he turned and made his way to the door. And he stopped just by the cauldron that was bubbling on the fire. And he felt drawn to the cauldron. He almost felt that his hand was moving towards where the bread was concealed, but uh, he resisted the temptation to, for that would be stealing, dipping his piece of bread into the cauldron now, wouldn't it? And I'm not a thief, he said to himself. I'm a beggar, but I'm not a thief. That would be stealing. But there is something I can do that surely, surely would be... And he felt himself moving towards the cauldron and leaning over the steaming... Oh, and the aroma was incredible, intoxicating. And he decided there and then, what could be the harm in taking a great smell, a sniff of the soup? And then he could take the memory of the smell all the way back to that shadowy place where he would be undisturbed and unseen. And then he could tuck into his bread and imagine from the memory the smell of the soup. Imagine, imagine the taste. So he took a great big smell of the soup and made his way to the door. Just as he was about to step over the threshold, there was a great hand on his shoulder that spun him round and there was the restaurant manager saying, did you just take a smell of the soup. Uh, yeah, I, I, I did, <laughs> said the beggar. I mean, um, uh, but that's all I did. I hadn't, I hadn't taken anything. I hadn't... You took a smell of the soup. I watched you, the restaurant manager. You, you took a great big sniff of the soup. The soup. The, the soup. Ch 
yeah, 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 I did. I did, said the beggar. I, I admit it, I, I took a smell of the soup. I mean, I, I'm going now, just as you asked. Not so fast, said the restaurant manager, for, uh, for the smell of that soup you just took, you must pay. What? Oh, I said the beggar. I mean, uh, pay for the smell of the soup? Yeah, and the manager. <laughs> you must pay before you leave. Pay up now. He held out his hand. And said, I haven't, I haven't got any money. I've, I've got a piece of bread, but ah, put your bread away, said the restaurant manager. I want money. You must pay for smelling that soup. And you must pay now. And if you cannot pay, I will be taking you to the judge right this second. And he can decide what becomes of you, for you owe me. Well, who's ever heard of paying for the smell of something? Have you? We, we, we walk past a, a bakery some days. We, we smell the food cooking in restaurants all the time. We, we smell the, the delicious aromas emerging from people's houses when it's dinner time or lunch time or breakfast. Each of those meals has delicious smells that we associate with them. Who's ever heard of paying for smelling food? But the beggar found himself frog-marched across the square to the street that lay parallel behind by the great house with the golden gates and the one, two, three, four storeys high, the house of the judge. And the restaurant manager and the beggar were admitted to the house and seated in the front parlour, the place where the judge would judge his cases at any time of day or night, for this was the judge's job. At that very moment, the judge was tucking into dinner and uh, <laughs> had to be disturbed and, uh, okay, all oh, right, I'll be right with you, I'll be right there, dabbing his mouth and uh, looking wistfully at the meal that he would have to uh, kept warm or covered until he came back when he could finish and enjoy the rest and peace. But there was a case to judge. Here he was, he was ready. Downstairs he went to the parlour where the restaurant manager and the beggar were waiting. The judge sat on his, uh, his great pile of silk cushions and uh, much higher than the other two, of course, looked down at them both. And, uh, and heard both sides of the story. Hmm, said the judge. Let me see. Let me get this straight. You, uh, you want him to pay for the smell of the soup. Is that right? That's right. And you smelt the soup. Smelt the soup. He smelt the soup. You smelt the soup. He smelt the soup. And you want him to pay for smelling the soup. When you have no money, he has no money. You have no money? He has no money. He has no money, yet you want him to pay for the smell of the soup. The smell, the smell of the soup. The smell of the soup. The judge had a think. Hmm. Ah, ha, 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 said the judge. I have it. Since he has no money, I will pay for him. And with that, he, uh, he, uh, he put his hand into the depths of the silk cushions and, uh, and from it emerged a, a leather purse of, uh, of money. The gold in there, chinking away. A heavy purse full of gold coins. And uh, he opened and prized open the, the, the purse and uh, began to uh, take out a little stack of gold coins and the restaurant manager was watching each one as it uh, emerged from the purse and his eyes lighting up at the thought of the gold he would receive. He would be satisfied with that. Oh, more than satisfied. And uh, the judge uh, collected all of the gold coins into his fist, closed his fist and uh, gave the coins a little rattle. You could hear them chinking. 
against each other. And then he beckoned the restaurant manager over to him and said, bring, come closer, come, come, bring your ear closer to my fist, which the restaurant manager did, and he confused him. Then the judge proceeded to rattle the coins in the restaurant manager's ear. then bade the restaurant manager to sit back down again, and the judge opened up the purse once more and returned the coins to the purse and put the purse back where he found it, in the depths of his silk cushions. And the judge said, thank you very much. You, uh, you may both leave. Good night. Um, you have been paid, said the judge to the restaurant manager. Ah! Speechless. <laughs> You've been paid, said the judge. You may leave. I, I wish to return to my dinner. Be gone. <laughs> Good night. You've been paid. Is it the resident manager? Perplexed and, and, and cross and, and, and just beside himself? What do you mean? <laughs> You have been paid, said the judge. Perhaps I need to spell it out. You've been paid, you see, for the smell of the soup. You've been paid with the sound of the money. Now, good night to you. On your way, I will return to my meal and so he did, and the restaurant manager left, and the beggar went free and returned to his quiet, shadowy, shaded corner where he would be unseen and undisturbed. And finally, he ate his piece of bread whilst imagining the smell of the soup. The end. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that one, and I hope that um, I hope that that brings back memories for us all, actually, of uh, sharing food with each other. And I look forward to returning to those times uh, when we get through what we're going through now, returning to meeting with friends and meeting new people over food, and sharing our stories and uh, and our love of food. And uh, I wish you all well too. I think. Um, Look forward to seeing you and hearing your voices um, in, in those times yet to come. Now for a bit of fun. Come, um, you've got time for a, one of my favourite uh, trickster stories and um, little rascal who, uh, who, who's always looking for food. And this rascal's very, very greedy, doesn't mind being greedy, knows he's greedy, and doesn't like working at all. He, He's lazy. He really doesn't mind being lazy at all. He's greedy, he's lazy, so oh, I'm greedy, I'm lazy. That's me. <laughs> yeah. Like working, but he's greedy. Well then, you know, you've got to do some work to get some food, haven't you folks? I mean, that's, that's the way it works. But not this one. This one, instead of working for food, this one would play tricks on others. Tricks that would involve this one <laughs> getting food from others <laughs> by nefarious purposes. And of course, you may have already guessed, our friend in the story, our hero or anti-hero, if you wish, is Anansi the Spider. And Anansi sometimes wins and sometimes loses. And I wonder which, in this story, it will be win or a loss. Let's see if you can guess as the story goes on. High up in his tree, on a good day, sometime in the morning, and Nancy the spider was cooking in his kitchen. <laughs> he was cooking an enormous meal. <laughs> he had many legs. How many legs does a spider have? Eight. I think he used a two or 
Maybe one uh, to balance and all the other legs were busy doing things, making bread, stirring pots, chopping, you know, preparing. <laughs> Incredible amount of uh, food being prepared in his kitchen. Uh, yeah, Nancy, Nancy, yeah. If, uh, you've got lots of food going there. Yeah, I have. <laughs> Are you, um, you going to eat all that yourself then? Well, yeah, well I'd like to. See, <laughs> I'd like to, but yes. Well, today I've got a friend coming round for dinner. Oh, Nancy, that's nice. That's a nice thing, isn't it? Having a friend round for dinner. Yeah, it is nice, isn't it? I like uh, I like going round to places for dinner, and my friend likes coming to me for dinner. It's gonna be great. <laughs> hold, hold, hold on, Nancy. Yeah. What's troubling you? Well, uh, uh, hang on, maybe I think I know what's troubling you, Nancy. Mm, yeah. You don't like sharing, do you? Mm, no, <laughs> I don't. You find, you find sharing really difficult, don't you? Yeah, I do. Uh, I don't like sharing. I mean, uh, I like eating. Um, I'm greedy. Um, I like... Um, I like food, uh, I don't like working, I'm lazy, and I find it really, 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 really hard to... You can say it, Nancy. Come on, you can say the word, can't you? And Nancy couldn't even say the word share, let alone do it. All right, Nancy, all right. I mean, but, and yeah, I know, is that a Nancy? I'm, I'm preparing an enormous meal for my friend who's coming round. And so that means tonight I'm going to have to, you're going to have to, you're going to have to share, aren't you? Yeah. But that, that's a good thing, Nancy. It's a really, really good thing to do, sharing your food. I'm sure you'll be able to do it. I mean, who, who's coming round? Who's your friend? It's my best friend. Is it? Who's your best friend then? Um, uh, my best friend's Turtle. Oh, Turtle, hang on. He lives down, 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 down below, doesn't he? Yeah. And he lives down, 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 down underneath the water, doesn't he? Yeah. In fact, his place is right at the bottom of the river, isn't it? Really couldn't be any further away from you at the top of your tree, could it? I know, it's a long way. It takes it ages to, uh, to climb up my tree. <laughs> Doesn't take me very long to get down my tree, but it takes me quite a long time to get down to his place at the bottom of the river because I find it quite difficult to, to swim right down. <laughs> so yeah, he's gonna, he's gonna take a long time to get up, uh, up my tree and, and I'm sure he's gonna be very hungry when he gets here and he's gonna really look forward to the food. Yeah, I'm sure he is, and Nancy. I think that's, um, he, he'll deserve a good meal, won't he, when he gets here. That's a really, really good thing, yeah. Yeah, it is. <laughs> yeah. But I'm going to have to try my best, aren't I? Yeah, you certainly are, Nancy. You're going to have to... Can you say it? I'll try. <laughs> not bad, Nancy, not bad. But the word share. Yeah, you're going to have to share, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, the day wore on. Turtle had already made his journey from his home. He was probably halfway there, maybe even closer up the tree. You <laughs> can imagine how hard it must have been for him climbing up that tree. Well, hard, I tell you, very difficult. And Nancy was putting the final touches on the meal. He had begun to, um, begun to lay the table and get everything ready and even put some flowers on it and collected earlier. Oh, it was wonderful. The table was groaning with food. Oh, and Nancy laid the plates then. <laughs> one for him, enormous plate. One for Turtle, smaller plate. Hang on, and Nancy, yeah. You can't give a Turtle a smaller plate. That's not good sharing at all, is it? What, what, what do you mean? Uh, I've got a big plate and Turtle's got a quite a smaller plate. No, 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 Nancy, that's not how it works. You can't, you can't, you can't give your guest a smaller plate than you. Put a Put a, put a bigger plate out, one that's the same as your one, or if you haven't got two of those, two plates that are the same size, Nancy. Ah, oh, I didn't, didn't know that. Uh, all right, then. Nancy found another large plate. 
One for him, one for Turtle. It's better, Nancy. Why don't you, um, I'll keep an eye on things. Why don't you go off and, uh, go and spruce yourself up and get ready now, because your guests will be knocking on the door soon, okay? Off you pop. Everything's fine. That looks wonderful. You've done a really, really good job. And that's it. You just think about what you need to do now, which is get ready. Off went Nancy to get ready. Well, after a while, you know, <laughs> there was a knock on the door. Knock, knock, knock. <clears throat> and Nancy froze. And, and, and Nancy, <clears throat> aren't you going to answer the door? <clears throat> well, Turtle's here. You've got to... <clears throat> what, do, what do you mean? <clears throat> if I'm quiet, said Nancy, maybe Turtle will go away. <laughs> And then I can t and I see, and then you can eat all the food yourself. That's not the idea! Answer the door! Knock, knock, knock! Knock, knock, knock! <gasps> all right, all right, and then Anthony. I'll answer the door. <laughs> so he did. He answered the door. And oh, it became Turtle, his friend, his best friend. Oh, it's nice to see you. <laughs> Turtle, Daddy. See, the smell's so good. This <laughs> is wonderful. I'm tired. Yeah, it's been a long journey. <laughs> and Turtle saw the table. And Nancy, look what you've done. <gasps> you've, uh, you've really pushed the boat out today. <gasps> what a wonderful meal you've prepared. I'm really, really looking forward to it. I'm so looking forward to this meal. And Nancy, it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> And Turtle was just about to sit down at his place, and Nancy said, Stop! <laughs> you can't sit down! <gasps> Why ever not? said Turtle. Well, <laughs> you're being rude, Turtle. Am I? said Turtle. Yeah! No, Nancy. Really rude. Am I? How, um, <laughs> um, how am I being rude? said Turtle. Uh, turtle, you're my best friend. Uh, you, above anyone, should know. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to spell it out for you. Turtle, you're being rude because, as everybody knows, you can't sit down at a Nancy's table with dirty, muddy feet. Look at your feet. Look at them. Poor Turtle was <laughs> flustered, Look, looked at his feet, and sure enough, there was a little bit of river mud on. And, and he said, oh, I didn't know, I didn't realise. So, I'm so sorry, Nancy. I mean, what, what do you say? You need to go back down to the river and wash them properly, uh, Nancy. And then, uh, then you can come back up and then you can sit down again. And then we can have our meal together. So uh, off you go then. <laughs> off you go. You go and wash your feet. Turtle left, climbed back down the tree to wash his feet. Then he climbed back up the tree again and... By the time he, well, let's just say he opened the door, he came in and he, there was a Nancy sitting at the table with an enormous, there was no food left. A Nancy had eaten every last crumb. Oh, oh, said Turtle. Well, uh, that looks like that was a good meal, a Nancy. Oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it was, said Nancy. It, it, was, it was a delicious meal. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, said Turtle, um, in that case, uh, one good meal deserves another. Uh, uh, you and Nancy can, um, can come to my home tomorrow evening and, 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 and have dinner with me. Would you like that? Oh, sure. <laughs> so, Nancy, that would be lovely. I, I love coming round to people's places for dinner. I mean, it's, it's wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Turtle. Yeah, as you say, one good meal deserves another. Yes, yes, it's your turn to cook now, isn't it? Of course. So, tomorrow evening, then. I'll see you then. Bye! <laughs> and then the Turtle went home feeling very, very hungry that night. And then Nancy went to bed feeling very, very full. The next day came, and Nancy spent most of the day getting ready to go out for dinner. 
choosing the right outfit was important to Anansi. And he, he finally arrived at uh, the best combination, and uh, that involved him putting on his smartest jacket. This is the jacket he always wore when he went round to people's for dinner. It was a Nancy's dinner jacket. He only wore it for these special occasions. And it's very smart indeed. Wonderful. You look great, Nancy. I think it's time for you to go now, isn't it? You need to get down the tree and you've got to get to the bottom of the river. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've got to get down to the bottom of the river, Nancy. And, uh, yeah, I'd better get going now, shouldn't I? Yeah. Do I look all right? Yeah, you look great, Nancy. You should go. And Nancy climbed down his tree, came to the river. There it was, clear as crystal. And at the bottom of the river, uh, Nancy could see Turtle's home and Turtle at the bottom of the river sort of waving up at Nancy. Come on down, yeah, dive in and dinner's almost ready. <laughs> Come on. So Nancy said, right, here we go. Uh, this, is, uh, this is it. And, uh, and he took a one, uh, two, three, whee! splat began floating on the surface of the water. He, he tried sort of diving down a little he said, mm, to try and to try he said, no, 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 no joy. Um, uh, I'll try again. He said mm, dive then mm, floated back up again. This was going to be difficult. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm just a bit too light to dive down to the bottom. This is a problem. Out onto the bank of the river he went once more and it's right, let's start again. No, no, hang on, I've got an idea. He had an idea. I've got an idea. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. And Nancy began collecting rocks and stones and river pebbles from wherever he could find them and began filling the pockets of his smart dinner jacket. Yeah. And soon his pockets were very full and he was extremely heavy. Perfect. Ah, now I'll, I'll just sink straight to the bottom. A one, a two, a three, and a wee Splosh! Down, down, down went a Nancy, sinking to the bottom of the river. <sighs> Once down, he was welcomed in by Turtle into his home. And a Nancy said, oh! The table was there, and oh, a groaning table full of food. Oh, turtle, this is wonderful. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> You've really pushed the boat out today. And he was just about to sit down to tuck into the enormous meal. <laughs> Went, oh, stop, uh, 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 said Turtle. Well, what, Nancy, what, 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 what? what? You can't sit down, said Turtle. Why, why am I not? Nancy, oh, it's time, isn't it? What have I done wrong? I don't know what have you done. You're being rude, Nancy. Am I? Nancy? Uh, he was mortified. I, mean, I didn't mean to be rude. What have I done? Oh, Nancy, I mean, you're my best friend. You, above all, should know. Maybe I'll have to spell it out to you. <laughs> Nancy, everybody knows, and now you do. You can't sit down at Turtle's table wearing a jacket. You've got to take it off before you sit down. Take off the jacket and then you can, we can tuck in. <laughs> it's so rude. Oh! <laughs> no, Nancy began unbuttoning the rude, offensive jacket <laughs> you should never ever wear at Turtle's table and uh, peeled it off and then <laughs> the jacket heavy with rocks and stones and river pebbles. Whoop, boom, whoop. And Anansi found himself floating up to the surface of the river once more and floating in the breeze like a feather or a leaf on the surface of the river. And down he could see through the crystal clear water, turtle eating and eating and eating. And Nancy went home that night and went to bed very hungry. He had nothing in, he hadn't been shopping and hadn't expected to cook that evening. And turtle went to bed feeling very, very full.
the end. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that one. I think um, it's another food story, isn't it? That's foods on my mind at the moment. Um, it's, uh, again, I think it's all about uh, getting back to those times where we can, we can share with friends around the table. I've got a final story for you, a quick one, and it's a very, very old story, and I'm sure this one is told in many places around the world, and uh, hello again to you, wherever you are in the world today, and um, from whatever platform that you're, uh, you're viewing this story on, make sure you visit um, www.worldstorytellingcafe.com, where you can watch this story over and over again if you wish, and also visit uh, the, the full story circle that's happening at the moment uh, of every storyteller whose offerings are wonderful. Um, food of a sort for these times, stories. And my final one, uh, my final story for this set is, it's about a very, very old man and, and a piece of fruit that he adores. And it's what he does with the fruit afterwards, um, instead of throwing it away. A very old man sat at his window. He was the oldest man in the village. There was no one older than he. And this, uh, this village where he lived was the village he had been born in, and he'd lived and worked there all his life. He'd worked hard too. But now his working days were over, and he would sit on his chair looking out of his window at village life every day. And he would see new children arriving and, and growing up. And, and every day he would, uh, he would sit there and rain or shine through all the seasons. You could see the mountains in the distance and the far off hills and, and the plains and, and water of the, of the river that ran very close to the village. And every day someone, younger legs, would bring a, a bowl of fruit, whatever was in season for him to eat and enjoy. His favourite fruits were soft fruits these days. He, uh, he found them easier to eat. And he had a particular favourite. Uh, it's peach. Uh, do you like peaches? Peaches are great. They're wonderful. Um, I think I, I prefer nectarines, uh, but peaches I like too. And um, the old man delighted in peaches. Um, and uh, he, he reached for a peach in his bowl and began to eat. Mmm. Mmm. It's good. And he began enjoying the peach and, and looking out of the window at the view. But then his thoughts turned, turned a little sad, for he, he realised that this peach had not come from his village. It had come from, from somewhere else. It had been imported, for there was no longer a peach tree in the village. But there had been once, and he'd remembered being able to pick peaches as a young man. And so even as a, a teenage boy, he would pick peaches to his heart's content, but now the tree had gone. And he wondered as he finished the peach and left with the stone. But the time had come for him to take a walk, and he rarely took a walk. There was a big event in the village when he did, and today he would take a walk. So painfully he got up Downstairs he went, and out into the out into the open, into the village, his village, the oldest man in the village. And as he walked slowly, it would take him a while. Everyone stopped and and, and walked with him at a respectful distance. They wanted to know what he was doing. This was a a rarity. And he was carrying a peach stone, and people wondered, what's he what's he doing? Others began to catch on, and then. The old man found a spot, a perfect spot. Not the same spot where the other peach tree had grown, for sometimes if you plant too much of the same thing in the same place, it doesn't grow. Have you found that? He found another spot, a better spot. Perfect for the weather, for the seasons, for the winds and the movement of the sun. For he knew his village inside out, seen it in all conditions. He managed to crouch down and, and, and dig a hole and, and he planted the peach stone in the ground. And it was then and only then that, that, <laughs> that younger legs and arms brought the water and watered the, watered the stone for him and he was able to stand back or, or even sit, a chair would have appeared from, 
from nowhere and just sit and watch as they finished off the job he had started, the planting of a new peach tree that would be grown from the stone. And it was then, and only then, that, not necessarily mocking laughter, but laughter nonetheless was heard. It was a strange laugh. It was a, a stranger's laugh. Someone they knew not in the shadows of the tree who emerged. And indeed, it was a stranger. It was a traveller who was passing through. And he found this amusing. Why are you, uh, why are you planting this, uh, old man? For hate to say it, but uh, I will. You, you won't live to see this tree bear fruit, let alone grow. Uh, there'll be no peaches for you to enjoy, so, so why? And the old man sighed and smiled, smiled to himself and <laughs> fixed the stranger with a glare and said, I'm not planting for me. It's not me who will reap the reward of this planting. I plant this tree for those yet to come, for them to enjoy the fruit that will be born on the tree. For I remember being younger and being able to pick peaches to my heart's content. And I plant it for those who are yet to come to enjoy the same. And so the stranger apologised, went on his way, and the old man returned to his home. The end. And in that way, the stories that we're telling in this circle, for you all around the world, for all to freely access from whatever platform that you're watching this from, we're planting these stories for you too, and for those yet to come. And remember, of course, um, tell the stories to others, for if you don't, they'll be lost forever, just as that peach tree had gone but eventually was replaced by the old man and his thoughts and his kindness. Thank you ever so much, everyone. Now, visit www.worldstorytellingcafe.com and watch all of the other stories too. And there's a little button there, a widget, that says tip. And it's a hat symbol, for indeed the hat has been passed to me. It has been my turn this afternoon on Monday the 30th to tell stories to you. And I will be passing the hat on to another teller. We have the wonderful Richard Thompson this evening. You should tune in to enjoy as well. But that hat is there, out there in the cloud, for you to donate something to if you wish. I'm glad you've enjoyed the stories. But if you wanted to show your appreciation financially, please feel free to click on that hat and there'll be a secure payment method that will go straight to the tellers. Thank you ever so much, everyone. It's been great seeing you. See you again. Good afternoon.